Okay, switching gears, uh, let's talk a little bit about visual testing. So uh, I've spent a good deal of time in the last three or four months um, researching and writing about and, and using visual testing in my practice. Uh, and it's, um, it's really fascinating because I think that uh, there's a perception that visual testing is hard to do. And uh, it's the technology is getting a lot better to the point where it's easy to get started and the value you get from it is actually very tremendous. So just a quick primer on what visual testing is for the uninitiated. Um, what you do with visual testing is you check to see that an application's UI appears correctly to its users. And the goal is to find visual bugs before your users do. And by visual bugs, I mean things like um, font rendering issues, uh, layout issues, just anything on the page that's, that's out of place. And there's loads of issues that humans can spot by manually doing visual checks, but there are still loads that you'll miss as well. Um, and uh, it's, it's just fascinating because it's also useful for verifying content. Um, things like charts, dashboards, uh, really rich pages that have a lot of functionality but also have a lot of content. Um, and normally to, to test uh, a lot of this, this type of stuff would involve um, a challenging effort from an automated functional testing perspective just to make some simple assertions that might be brittle potentially and still not give you a ton of coverage on the page. But with a few lines of code, you get hundreds of assertions because you now are actually checking everything on the page as opposed to just one or two elements to make sure that the state of the page is as you expect. And there's at least 16 open source solutions that I've come across um, to get started with visual testing. Um, and a lot of them work um, in tandem with Selenium. Um, and of course, um, as the co-founder, sorry, as the founder of Selenium, uh, and as the creator of Selenium uh, always told, tells me, before you can recommend a technology, uh, you have to be able to mention something bad about it. And so there are some challenges uh, with visual testing to watch out for. Um, mainly, there's, a, there's two. The, there's managing the complexity, because um, normally for web testing, we have the complexity of uh, different browser and OS combinations uh, and incorporating mobile, of course, adds device. And then we deal with the responsive and, and we start to talk about screen sizes and then um, and everything kind of goes goes wild. So we have that complexity when dealing with visual testing, but then we're adding in visual checks on top of that. So it almost compounds the amount of things that we have to care about. Um, but also there are fal false positives to watch out for within, uh, within visual testing. Um, things like content that shifts just a little bit, um, dynamic content, um, typos on the screen. There, there are plenty of use cases where visual testing might just trip up and give you, uh, say something failed and it's clearly not a failure. Maybe it's within some sort of tolerance that you want, um, but maybe you increase the tolerance and then all of a sudden you miss things that were legitimate issues you wanted to catch. Um, and so managing complexity is hard because you know maybe you have to stand up your own Selenium grid, um, you have to have your own you know, set of devices, you have to have um, uh, an infrastructure that to maintain and then for for dealing with uh, false positives a lot of the open source tools kind of fall down at the same point um, with false positives so there's two um, solutions that I use um, in my practice that work well um, and the first one is um, I use sauce labs uh, because it just is so easy to just have any device or browser that you need um, and it's, it's turnkey um, the only issue is you just have to beam across the internet. Um, so depending where you are in the world, there may be some latency, but to me it's really worth it um, just, to, just to get access without having to set up your own infrastructure. Um, so on top of that, uh, I use AppleTools Eyes uh, to do visual testing. Um, and it's super easy to connect the two together to an existing test script. So you can take your existing Selenium script, add in visual testing, and get the, the browser or device that you care about. And then uh, the thing with Apple Tools Eyes is it doesn't run into a lot of the same false positive issues that open source libraries run into. Um, it actually catches a lot of visual defects that other solutions might trip up on. And so the, the, ta the point of this, um, this example isn't to pitch you on these tools. I recommend them just because I use them and I think they're tremendous. Um, but the hopeful thing that comes out of this is that you say, hey, maybe I should consider visual testing. And I absolutely encourage you to check out the open source tools as well because um, they're all very useful. Um, so, but this example, I'll just step through real quick. 
let's say we have an existing login test um, that looks like this. Um, and we have a simple setup that creates an instance of Firefox, and then we have a teardown that quits it after the session, and then the test itself, this public void succeeded, um, loads a page, the login page example from the internet, um, and then it loads up the login form, inputs the username, inputs the password, submits the form, and then asserts that after the login completes that there is a success uh, notification flash, flash message at the top, um, just to make sure that we were able to successfully log in. Now, if we were to take this um, and incorporate uh, visual testing with Apple Tools Eyes, it would look like this, just the top half of this test here. Um, we pull in the, uh, the very first line, you see the class for Apple Tools Eyes, um, and then create a field variable uh, underneath the private web driver, driver instance. Uh, and then uh, in the setup, we use the uh, eyes variable to store a, a new eyes session, which is referencing the, the eyes class that we imported. And then we set the API key, which in this case, I'm actually storing in an environment variable, but you could very easily just hard code that value if that's your preference. Um, and then uh, we call eyes.open and pass in the web driver session. And then it, this connects to Apple Tools eyes and then returns us a web driver object. Um, and in this, uh, this last line here in setup, we're actually specifying the name of the application and the name of the test. So that way we have some uh, semantic metadata that we can reference when looking at the, the job dashboard. So if there's a failure, we know uh, what, which test was actually running and at which application. And then in um, the test itself, we're, uh, we're adding a couple of things. We're adding the, these eyes.check window uh, calls. And this is basically putting checkpoints in our workflow um, uh, that we're basically telling Apple Tools Eyes to take a snapshot, an image of the application. Um, and then as we run this test multiple times, we'll have a baseline after the first test run that we can accept uh, or reject. And if we accept it, future test runs will capture an image at each of these points in the workflow and then compare them to the baseline. And then if, uh, and at the end of this test method, uh, we call eyes.close, which closes the session and actually triggers um, an, asser uh, an assertion check against each of these different check windows steps. Um, and then if at any of those points there is a failure, uh, the test would raise an exception and give us a link, a URL to the job uh, in Apple Tools Eyes. And then in the teardown, we just add a little bit of cleanup. Um, we want to abort the session um, if it's not closed properly, which um, is just a cleanup in case eyes.close raises an exception due to a failure. So if we were to run this um, uh, and we had a legitimate failure, it would look like this. This is within my IntelliJ. Um, it's this URL here that is the URL to the, uh, to the job in Apple Tools Eyes. And if we open it, it looks like this. So if, it, if there was actually uh, a visual anomaly, and in this case, um, the logout button has vanished. Um, the way the test was written, we, we, it would pass with Selenium, where it would say, oh, I found the success flash message at the top, but it, uh, it would miss this visual issue where a button just vanished for some reason. And so aside from that, we can actually do a, a visual diff comparison with what the, page, what, what the page is supposed to look like. And then we can actually choose to accept or reject um, this new image. And if we reject it, then we clearly are saying the baseline is correct. Next time we run the test, then, uh, then it should fail again if that button isn't present. But if we accept it, then we're saying make this the new baseline. So if we wanted to incorporate something like Sauce Labs and say, I want to now run this test against a different browser and compare uh, this, this Firefox instance against a uh, version of Internet Explorer, and just see what the disparities are, then you would incorporate something like this, where by using um, Selenium's remote web driver and desired capabilities functionality, uh, you can specify the browser version, the platform, as in the operating system, um, the name of your test, uh, and then point it at Sauce Labs, which would give you uh, a browser instance, uh, just like running locally. Um, and then you would pass that to Apple Tools uh, to use for grabbing screenshots. 
And so, so then the test execution is happening not on your machine, but in two different uh, parts of the internet. And, and then that's pretty much it. Your test otherwise stays the same. And this is actually a very similar configuration to how you would configure Selenium Grid. But the difference here is that um, the grid endpoint is in Sauce Labs behind basic auth. So we have to specify uh, the environment variable of the username and access key, uh, which is what I'm doing here. Again, you could also just specify a hard-coded value for those if, if that's your preference as well. And once you run the test, this is what it would look like. Um, it has all the different actions with screenshots, uh, and it actually captures a video as well. And there's, of course, uh, the log from Selenium as well as the metadata that, metadata that was passed as part of the test configuration. So uh, I don't expect... Uh, my, I don't expect I'll be able to do, do it justice what visual testing is actually going to help you accomplish or what the limitations are, but I have a series of write-ups that can be useful for you to reference on your own as you dig into it. Um, the first one is this getting started write-up, which actually breaks down all of the different open source solutions and steps through an example of using one of them. Um, and then I have two different write-ups about different false positives that you're, you'll run into, um, and some potential workarounds, and then where mitigation strategies just don't really work that well. Uh, and then how to add visual testing to your existing Selenium tests. And then, of course, if you're dealing with behavior-driven development, I have an example using Cucumber and incorporating visual testing. And uh, there's still some uh, pieces that I didn't cover in this example, which are actually covered in this write-up more thoroughly. Things like um, configuring your test runs so that the test name is dynamic, uh, so you don't have to hard code that value, as well as setting the job status correctly so that when we run our tests in Sauce Labs, um, it'll, t it'll say pass or fail um, when the job runs, as well as uh, pass the correct uh, dynamic test name. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for that. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't also talk a little bit about Selenium Grid. Um, and uh, there's several links here. So if you want more info on Sauce Labs, I have a write-up specifically about how to use them and, um, and some more about the primer behind Selenium Remote, Selenium uh, grid and all of that, but specifically for Selenium Grid, I have a breakdown uh, at tip number 52 um, on what Selenium Grid is and, and a simple example of how to stand it up and connect to it. Um, and then I was fortunate, fortunate enough to have a guest post from Diva, uh, Dima Kovalenko, who's the author of uh, Selenium Design Best Practices book uh, and the uh, core maintainer for Selenium Grid Extras, which is a library to uh, help maintain a Selenium Grid infrastructure and do some video recording. Um, definitely worth a read because it has some good pointers about how to fine-tune your grid if you're already running one. Um, so um, those are worth a read as well.